brothers, sisters, loved in Christ. So this morning, we looked at the Beatitudes. We looked at how Jesus started the Sermon on the Mount by talking about the character of disciples, about what disciples look like and what they are and the blessedness or the happiness that is theirs. And so as we're looking at the Beatitudes and we're thinking about this morning, there was this shift that happened in verses 11 and 12, right, where Jesus went from saying, blessed are so-and-so for they are, like, in verse 11 and 12, there's that transition from they to you, where Jesus, like, directly addressing the disciples and talking about persecution. Now, he ties their character to him, right? Blessed are you, you know, when They persecute you. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. Why? Falsely on my account. So here Jesus clearly ties the the character of the disciples to him and and that the persecution that they will experience is going to be connected to to their being associated by his name because they follow him. Following Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus will be costly. Yes, happiness and blessedness, but with its suffering. Right? Jesus says the same, Mark 10, verse 30, right? He's like, you know, whoever follows me, you know, loses, you know, whoever loses, you know, husband or wife, children, mother, father, or fields, houses, they will receive 100-fold and with it persecutions. Following Jesus is happiness, it is blessedness, but there's a suffering that comes with it, a persecution. So what Jesus is doing now in verses 13 through 16 is he's continuing on that as he talks to his disciples about being salt and light, he's telling them about the purpose of their character. It's gonna cost you to follow me. And I need to tell you about who you are. I need to tell you about your purpose. And knowing the purpose of something you are or knowing the purpose of something that you're doing, it does a number of things, doesn't it? Like, there's three things that I just want to point out. When you think about being told the purpose of who you are, the purpose of what you're doing, one is that purpose clarifies, right? It's the why. Why? You know, it further explains what we're doing with the why. You know, and not why, like, you know, if you're, I did this as a kid, and my kids did it. I'm sure no kids here do this, but if your mom or your dad tells you, you need to go clean the kitchen, and you say, but why? Generally speaking, that's because you are expecting your parents to give you an answer that will justify you doing that activity. Now, that's not what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is saying, when we talk about purpose clarifying, there's a way in which purpose can clarify so that it helps you understand what you're doing. You begin with the end in mind. Like, what is the purpose of what we're doing here Oh, it's going to do this, and now I understand more clearly why we're doing it. And I get, I understand more clearly the what. It clarifies. We understand. But purpose can also encourage, right? Like, it tells us the actual impact of what we're doing. You know, it, it tells us about the influence that what we're doing is having on ourselves, on others, on the world around us. It encourages us to do what we're doing. And then purpose can also fortify, right? Like, you, you can have this, it, it, knowing the purpose of what you're doing can give you resolve to do things that are difficult and painful. 
because you know what is being accomplished or what is being done. We know it's worth it, and we know there's nothing that we want to do more than that thing. It fortifies. So it clarifies, it encourages, it fortifies. That's what Jesus is doing here. It's as though he's saying to his disciples, in being who you are, you know, the Beatitudes, in following me, I mean, being persecuted for the sake of my name because you follow me, you are being who you are and what you were meant to be. You're being salt and light and you are vital to the world. If you stop being who you are, if persecution, if resistance because of me stops you, from being who you are, you lose your function and the world is worse for it. The purpose, Jesus is saying, the purpose of your character is as beautiful and powerful as the character itself and I need you to see that. That's what Jesus is doing in verses 13 through 16. And before we dive into it, it's just really important for you to see. Like, look at the passage This is not about how to be salt and light. Like, you see nothing in here about Jesus telling you how to be salt or how to be light. And there is actually no command. You know, be salt, be light. That's not here at all. Like, this is... This is about how we are salt and light and how knowing that clarifies, encourages, and fortifies us to be who we are as disciples. So now let's jump into this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two things. We're going to talk about salt and light and then just kind of work out some implications of what that means. What that means is we just be who we are. So salt, salt of the earth. Now salt at that time, as you may know, was kind of had two purposes. One was as a seasoning. It it brought flavor to bland foods. But also, and importantly, it was a preservative. It kind of served as an antiseptic. Like if you get hurt, don't advise this. It does hurt. Like if you cut yourself, you put salt in the wound, it stings. Like that's literally an expression. It was like salt in the wound. But it serves as sort of an antiseptic. It fights infection. And it slows down decay. People would would rub salt on their meat and and on different things. Before refrigeration, you know, you kind of needed that to slow down decay in food and meats. And so what Jesus is saying is, is that as Christians, as those who belong to him, who follow him, who display the characteristics of the Beatitudes. You know, we we bring flavor to a world. We bring a flavor to the world that it is missing and which changes the flavor of the world, everything that we come into contact with. And as Christians, we act as a sort of antiseptic that slows down the decay that is in the world because of sin. The world is dying. Death entered the world. We read in the call to worship this this afternoon, John 1, 1 to 5, like Jesus is life and he's light. And we belong to Jesus Christ and we get our saltiness from him. Like Jesus came into the world to defeat sin and death. He did that on the cross. He brought us new life. And those who belong to Jesus, who are connected to him by faith, they have something of that new life in them. And, they, and we, as those who belong to Jesus, we bring this new life with us wherever we go. Like, do you understand? That's who you are. You belong to Jesus and something of that new life 
that he won for you, it lives inside you. And that everywhere you set your foot, you take that new life with you. It's like if there was a black and white photo as Christians, Jesus saying, you walk into the middle of that photo and you colorize that photo. There is just like, just emanating from you. Everything that you interact with, it's colorized. Like, like salt flavors food, you change the world around you. Because, precisely because, you belong to me and you carry me in you. You carry my life in you. That means that when you enter into situations where there's death and decay, you carry that new life with you and you push back the decay. Like there's a cancer and you come into the body and that cancer is pushed back. That's who you are. You are the salt of the earth. And then what Jesus does is he says, you're the light of the world. Now for us, we take light for granted. We have electricity, we turn on a light, but in the ancient world, I don't know if you've had this, this is, might help you kind of experience. You ever been camping like up north? You know, you, I have a friend that books trips for us and he makes us drive five hours like to like halfway, whatever it's called. It's like, it's halfway to, I don't know where. But at night, like if there's no other lights around you, you, you just see the whole, the, it's just incredibly dark. You, you try to put your hand in front of your face, you can't see it. Like we're so used to light that we just take it for granted. But in the ancient world, if it was dark and there were no stars and no moon shining, it was dark. You didn't want to travel at night. You needed light. It brought safety and it showed the way. And Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Now interestingly, in John 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And so it's clear that what he's saying here about his disciples is the same thing. But Jesus' light and our light is connected. For those who shine, we who shine, who belong to Jesus, who are connected to the name of Jesus, those who are persecuted for the name of Jesus, we shine the light of Jesus. It can be no other light. It's not our own light. It's not the light of how great we are. It's the light of Jesus. He's our light. And we carry this light of Jesus around inside us and we shine it to those around. And the light of Jesus is his death his resurrection, his ascension. It's the good news of forgiveness of sins, new life in Jesus, and the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. You want to see what the light is, the light we carry? Look at the end of the book of Matthew, Matthew 28. What does Jesus say to his disciples? Matthew 28, he, they meet him on the mountain. He's speaking to him right now in the Sermon on the Mount on a mountain. And they saw him and they worshipped him. And then Jesus says, verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I am the king. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's how the book of Matthew ends. With what we call the Great Commission. But that Great Commission is about shining the light of Jesus into the world. Telling them the good news of the true story of the world. There is a God in heaven. Sin happened. There's death. There's brokenness. There's decay. But God sent his son and he conquered death and he now rules. And I want to tell you about him. We shine the light 
of the good news of Jesus. And as we shine that light, we point people to him. And we point people to him by what we say and by what we do. They see our good deeds and they give glory to God. We don't do our good deeds and they say, look how great you guys are. No, we shine our light, the light of Jesus, and they give glory to God. Now the odd thing about this passage is that it's not about hypocrites or people who don't believe. Like I said that earlier, right? There's not a command to be light. Like this, th- there is no warning here. Like whatever warning element there is in this passage, you have to go to the previous passage. Because it's not about how to be a Christian. It's about being a Christian and shining your light. So these are people who are shining the light. Like if you're not shining, like this passage is of no use to you. Like this is about somebody who is shining the light and they just don't know how to do it. It's kind of like trying to hide their light. Like you ever tried to hide light? Like... (laughs) If you're in a theater and your phone goes off and it's like, you're like trying to, it's not only the noise, but it's like, it's like, it illuminates your face. It's like, or if you're, you got a flashlight on or something, people can see you. And Jesus is talking to people who belong to him, but they don't know what to do with the light. And Jesus is saying, this is who you are. You are light. Now, because you're light, don't hide it. You you put light on a stand. That's how light works. So I'm telling you, this is who you are, and this is what it means. You know, shining your light is your righteousness and your love on display, love for God, expressing your relationships with others, and that people may see it and give glory to God. So he's saying, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. That's who you are. Now, when we work that out, what does that mean? What does that mean right now, right here? And there's really two things that we can take away. Number one, we interact with the world. Like, we just do. You know, these verses are largely meaningless if we only interact with Christians. You know, it doesn't say you are the salt of your church. You are the light of your family and your friends. You know, I... If you think think following Jesus means that you keep to yourself and to your own kind as much as possible, I'm not sure what to say. I'm interested to know what you think this passage says to you. Like, if that's your idea of being a Christian, like, what do you think this passage means? And what does it say to you? Now, it's important for us to understand this. That if you're here today and you believe that following Jesus means a life of keeping to yourself and your own kind as much as possible. I just encourage you to consider whether or not what you call faith might simply be some type of allegiance to a cultural expression of community with deeply ingrained behaviors and beliefs and institutions. That what you're calling faith might be simply about family connections and relationships and not about Jesus. Now, this is something that goes for all Christians. I'm not just talking about, you know, our, we have a, you know, here is a reformed church. We have a, a community. We have families, all that. 
you look at churches all over the world, especially in North America, what is church? It's the best way to have a good family. Like, so when this passage, when Jesus says to you, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world, that this largely is a, is a passage that's difficult to get your mind around because what matters to you is family and Jesus is just the way you get family. Family is what matters. Relationships is what matters and Jesus is the way you get that. But Jesus is saying, no, I am what identifies you. I'm not saying family doesn't matter. He's not saying family doesn't matter. I'm not saying the relationships don't matter. It doesn't mean your local church doesn't matter. No, but the point is that people will come to Jesus thinking that they belong to him, but they have never interacted with the world, and Jesus will say to them, I think Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, I never knew you. You think of the, the wedding feast, Matthew 22, how did you get in? Throw him out. That whatever warning there is in this passage, it's for you to reflect on who you are, who you truly are in Jesus. That there is a way of saying that you're following Jesus that isn't following Jesus. Now if you're there, I can only point you back to the Beatitudes and say that is where happiness is found, true happiness. It's about knowing the reality behind everything and being aligned with that reality with all your heart, soul, and strength. And so I encourage you, if this passage is largely meaningless to you, that, that you would look into your heart with a deeper reflection on the true story of the world, the reality of God and the reality of Jesus that is real for you. you know, I'm not telling you to be something you're not. I'm telling you that Jesus says that when you follow him, this is who you are. That's the character of a disciple. You simply are this. You take Jesus with you wherever you go. You know, what if the world saw in us a way forward in the middle of all the toxicity of the world? That we would carry Jesus with us into situations where the decay is setting in, where people are angry. Where we would love people so powerfully in line with the love of Jesus, that people could not deny our effect, even though they may resent us. You know, it struck me a number of months ago, or maybe a month or two ago, there was a hockey player on a team on the West Coast that they were having a pride night. And he was a Christian, and, and he just said, I, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I cannot participate in this. And people were so upset with him. And there was an article in the National Post on this where the author who was familiar with the player said, this man before this day was uniformly called the nicest guy in hockey. And now, and he's, this guy wasn't a Christian who was writing the article. But it struck him that maybe this player was showing a way forward. Yes, he has beliefs, but I cannot deny he is the nicest man I've ever met in hockey. That even while he followed Jesus, people could not deny that there was something about him that changed when he walked around. My point is not to glorify a person, but to say, what if being who you are right now, that you've been hiding it, you've been feeling like you don't need to shine it, but the world needs you. And that's what Jesus is saying to you. 
Be who you are. You belong to me. And the world needs you to be who you are because you fight death and decay and you shine light in the darkness. That's who you are. And they will give glory to my Father in heaven when they see you. Second thing, we are different from the world. Like if, if one thing is that we, imp- it's just the implication of being salt and light means that we interact with the world. The second is that we're different from the world. I think this is a challenge that we face as Christians. There's a lot of pressure on us to look like the world in which we find ourselves. That this push to be relevant to the world around us means that we look so much like the world that we are actually of no purpose to the world. Did you ever think that through? Like, I use this in my catechism class. I got to, you guys go to McDonald's, you get French fries or salty. And you're like, you know, so actually, if I could ask you, try this. If you, don't try this. But I would like my French fries salted with salt that tastes like unsalted French fries. You guys catch what I'm saying? I'm seeing some confused looks. You want salt that tastes like potatoes. Like, why would you salt your potatoes with salt that tastes like potatoes? That's what Jesus is saying. Like, what is the point of salt that is no different than the thing that it's interacting with? We are different than the world. And Jesus is saying that your importance to the world is based precisely on that difference. You know, I was trying to imagine an, an illustration for, for a younger member. I, I've used, I used it when I preached in Ebenezer, so I've got to use it here. It's, it's written down. It's not that great. But I was just envisioning like, you know, like a family of salt shakers. So you've got the mom and the dad salt shaker. And then the little kids salt shakers are kind of falling behind and they're like, why do we got to taste so different than salt? Like, why do we got to taste so different? Why do we got to be so... It's like, and the mom and the dad are like, well, because we're salt. Or if you got like a family of candles kind of walking along and the, and the little kid candles are like, why do we got to be so bright? Because we're candles. We're shining. Like, Jesus is saying you are different. Like, I'm pretty sure the little kid salt shakers and the little kid candles were like, it would be so much easier if we were not different. And Jesus is saying, no, you belong to me. The world is stuck in death and decay and darkness. And you are life and light with me. You look different and you need to be different. That's the point. You know, if you're here today and you're feeling confused, you're feeling discouraged about following Jesus, that you're just tired from, why are we so different? Everybody is just angry with us. Like they see us as the problem. They're just like, why can't you just be like Jesus should have been? Do you ever get that? You know, non-Christians telling you, why aren't you guys more like what Jesus should have been? Which oddly looks exactly like them. But if you're here and you're just tired and you're worn out, then hear Jesus speak. Where he's like, I know. I know you're tired. I know it hurts. I know you're suffering. I've been there. I died for you. I went to the cross for you. I suffered shame and humiliation for you. I know, but I know the purpose for which I did it. That Jesus scorned the shame. That he knew what it would happen. But for the sake of that, he endured it all because he did it for you. He knew 
It was in Hebrews 4. He scorned the shame to bring us through. For us to be saved. He knew the cost and he knew the end. He knew the purpose. That for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and scorned the shame. That's Jesus. And Jesus, that Jesus, the one who suffered all for you, who scorned the shame for you because he knew the purpose. He is the one who says to you, be who you are. You don't need to tell me how hard it is. I know. But I'm telling you that the world needs you to be who you are. My Father calls you to be who you are. That the beauty of who you are is something that shines and gives glory to God. And I want you to hear this. Like, I suspect that there is a conviction that's growing as you hear this. A question of how. I want to be light. I want to be salt. Like, what does that look like? And so my encouragement to you as we kind of talk that about implementation of this, like, what does it look like in time? It's going to be different for all of you, but start with this. Imagine you're on a team and it's the end of the game and the coach is giving instructions to all the players about how to play the game and he says to you, not you, don't you worry. You just stay over there. Your contribution will be not to be engaged and not to participate. Your best play, like you don't want that, right? You want to be in the game. And that is the number one thing, is to say in your heart, I want to be in the game, I want the ball, I want the puck. Like, I don't know, if, for those of you who are athletes, you might be getting that, but, but if you're not, like there's times in your life where you're like, I don't want this pressure, I don't want this on me. Like, I want somebody else to do it. But Jesus says to you, you want the ball. You want, the, you want to be in the game. You want to be in this situation because you know who you are and that you are deeply valuable to what I'm doing in the world. Like, to have that, to start with that and then to reflect on how your purpose clarifies, encourages, and fortifies that tomorrow you go out, well, tomorrow's a holiday, so Tuesday, you go out into the world and you follow Jesus and you be who you are. You just live the new life that he's given to you. You live a life that is aligned with the reality of the world, the reality of God and the reality of what sin has done to the world and what Jesus has done in saving us. You just live with the reality of the true story of the world. And whenever you face difficulties, you remind yourself of the purpose. Jesus said, this is who I am. This is who you are. And that you receive encouragement from knowing who you are. That your purpose is clarified to bring glory to God to fight death and decay, to show new life and that you become fortified, that you become a rock. You might not be here today feeling like you're a rock. But Jesus, your rock, is telling you, I'm your rock. Follow me and be who you are. It's a beautiful purpose the purpose of disciples, and may God bless us as we be who we are in this world to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love, for your grace. Thank you that we can know who you are. And Father, we confess that sometimes we feel like we're insignificant, that we don't matter, 
And sometimes we feel like it's just so difficult to follow you. And Father, we know that you don't need us to be who we are, to be salt and to be light. But we do know that that's what you've made us in Jesus. So Father, may we be those who love you and love our neighbors. And that the greatest thing, and may we be, have this realization grow on us that one of the greatest acts of love for our neighbors is for us to be who we are. Father, may you fight the fear that's in us. May we be given courage that comes not from how great we are, but from Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Father, may you give us strength to follow you in times where it's difficult because, Lord, we confess it's getting more difficult. We've been spoiled for a couple of generations here where it's been easy to follow you because everybody else said they were following you. And, Lord, we live in a world where when we follow you, people kind of think we're the problem. But, Father, may we follow you all the same. May, be, may we be the life and the light that enters into people's lives as we follow Jesus. And may we bring glory to you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.